Good morning. Good morning. I'd like to welcome you all today as we uh, celebrate. Spring is here, a little rain, a little sun. We're, we're thankful that it's spring in northern Idaho. Just one thing I'd like to share with actually two as we get started this morning. Uh, this is the final week of the story. We've been working on this since September in our walk through the uh, Old and New Testament of the Bible. This is the final week, the book of Revelation. Next week, you're going, okay, how do you follow that up in Bible class? We're going to be taking the next step in our Sunday morning Bible class. We've gone through the story. We've seen how all the pieces of the Bible fit together. The next question is, okay, how is this done? So next week, we're going to start a series called The Present Future in our Sunday morning class that talks about taking God's Word out to a community that is rapidly changing, to people in a, in, that are rapidly changing. How do we take the truths of God's Word to connect with people where they are at in our community currently and share the love of Jesus in a way that they will, can relate to in a way that we can grow together? By the way, that's not as easy as it might sound. So we're going to take a 12-week journey in our Sunday morning Bible class to the present future where uh, we look at the way things are changing and how we can remain faithful and true to God's Word while still connecting with the changing world. So that will start next week. That's all I really have, um, unless there's going to be something mentioned about the yard sale. Or, yeah, the Little Lamb's yard sale. Faith? So this coming Friday and Saturday is our one kind of big fundraiser that we do for the school um, with the yard sale. So there's a lot of things getting uh, set up out there. If you want to help or participate, if you could um, drop off any donations until Thursday afternoon. We are setting up starting at 12 on Thursday, so that's always a, if the more hands the better. You can just show up at 12 and help us set up tables and organize stuff and price stuff. Um, I'm a terrible yard sailor, so I give stuff away. So <laughs> come and People love us. you for that. Day. Yeah, I know, but we need to make some money. And then, uh, so that goes on Friday, come shop it, and Saturday as well. So, um, and then of course, typically what we do after our yard sale is um, if there's another organization that may be looking to do a yard sale for raising funds, have them get in touch with me and they can come pick up whatever is left. So, you know, we've done that for Special Olympics before, different organizations that are having a yard sale in the future may want what we weren't able to sell. So. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, at this time, I invite you to stand as we go to our Lord in Prayer. Steve, would you uh, lead us in prayer, please? standing as we sing. It's printed in your service folder. He's risen. He's risen. Christ Jesus the Lord.
we lay it at the foot of the cross and receive from our Lord that forgiveness, that life, the freedom that he brings us in Jesus Christ. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Amen. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, therefore you are feared. Since we are gathered to hear God's word, call upon him in prayer and praise, and receive the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ in the fellowship of this altar. Let us first consider our unworthiness and confess before God and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, and that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God, our Heavenly Father, seeking his grace for the sake of Christ, and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Almighty God, have mercy upon us, forgive us our sin, and lead us to everlasting life. Amen. Almighty God, merciful Father, in holy baptism, you declared us to be your children and gathered us into your one holy church in which you daily and richly forgive us our sins and grant us new life through your Spirit. Be in our midst, enliven our faith, and graciously receive our prayer and praise through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let's go to our Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, you have put before us the vision of heaven in the book of Revelation, and it's a powerful one. Keep our hearts and our lives focused on that hope that we share as being your followers, that one day we will worship you not just by faith, but by sight, as we are with you face to face in heaven. We thank you for that blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. At this time, I'd ask you to pull out your blue insert. We have the joy this morning of a baptism. The baptism for Nash Leo Hansen. So the family will come up. And as you'll notice, this is participation. Make sure I have everything. <laughs> Let's begin. Our Lord commanded that everyone in his church be baptized, as Jesus said to his disciples in Matthew chapter 28. All authority on earth and in heaven has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have told you. Since Jesus has told us to do this, we are happy to baptize your child today. What is baptism? Baptism is not just plain water, but it is the water included in God's command and combined with God's word. What benefits does baptism give? It works forgiveness of sins, rescues from death and the devil, and gives eternal salvation to all who believe this, as the words and promises of God declare. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. Dan and Melissa, will you have your child baptized into the Christian faith? If so, answer, we will by the grace of God. We will by the grace of God. Will you raise your child in the word of God, teaching him the will and teachings of our Lord, setting examples for him in worship and life, and encouraging him to grow in his faith? If so, answer, we will by the grace of God. We will by the grace of God. And Mark and Angelica Wunsch. And will you as sponsors pray for this child throughout his life and yours? If so, answer, we will by the grace of God. We will by the grace of God. Will you make this, will you make his spiritual life your concern and together with his parents see to his education in the word of God? Will you see that he is presented for instruction in the word of God so he comes to know the meaning of his baptism and that he is well grounded in the basics of the Christian faith? If so, answer, yes, with the help of God. And now I ask this congregation, will you accept this child as another member under your care? If so, answer, we will by the grace of God. We will by the grace of God. May God enable us all to keep our promises. And how is this child to be named? Yes. 
the freak. That's why you hold them and not me. Nash Leo Hansen, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Smile and a big smile. <laughs> Receive the sign of the Holy Cross upon your head and upon your heart to mark you as one redeemed by Christ the crucified. And let us pray. Almighty God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has given you the new birth of water and of the Spirit and has forgiven you your sin, strengthen you with his grace to life everlasting. Peace be with you. Amen. Amen. Receive this burning light. Live always by the light of Christ and be ever watchful for his coming, that you may meet him with joy and enter with him to the light and peace of heaven with Jesus, the one who is the light of the world. We're already at the altar, so we pray. Almighty and most merciful Lord, we thank you that you graciously preserve and enlarge your family and have given Nash the new birth and holy baptism and made him a member of your kingdom. We ask that as Nash has become your child, you would keep him in his baptismal grace, that he may faithfully grow to lead a godly life to the praise and honor of your holy name. And finally, with all your saints, be granted the gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Through baptism, God has added Nash to his own family to declare the wonderful works of our Lord, who also called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. We welcome you to the Lord's family and look forward to working with you to spread the love of God. And now you, Nash Leo Hansen, with the Holy Spirit in your heart, go with the Lord's peace and with his blessing, now and forever. Amen.
They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death, or mourning, or crying, or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. Those who are victorious will inherit all this, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I'd invite you to stand for the reading of the Gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the fifth chapter. Very truly I tell you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be judged, but has crossed over from death to life. Very truly, I tell you, a time is coming, it has now come, when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. And he has given him authority to judge, because he is the Son of Man. Do not be amazed at this. For a time is coming when all who are in their graves will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done what is good will rise to life, and those who have done what is evil will rise to be condemned. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. We confess together our true Christian faith in the words of the Nicene Creed you'll find in your service folder and in the front. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of His Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, God of God not me, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us sin and for our salvation came down from heaven, and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us in our conscious Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the Scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church, and I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead, and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated. Um, let's sing together in preparation for the children's message. This banner will be as well.
children and young ones right up front for this morning's children's message. I got Heidi. <laughs> Almost lost your hat there, didn't you? Okay. We're going to keep this. Heidi, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about heaven. Because one of the songs we sing, Heaven's a Wonderful Place. You know what I thought heaven was when I was your age? What does that look like? Pizza! I thought heaven was a pizza buffet. I have always loved to have pizza. Because as far as I'm concerned, I could eat pizza every meal, maybe for a few weeks. But I could eat pizza every meal, and I'd be like, mmm, this is awesome. I love it. Now, do you think heaven's a big pizza buffet, though? Probably not. No, it probably isn't. Well, we just heard from a book of Revelation what heaven is like. And it says this, God is home with his people. He's going to live with them. He will be his people. God himself will be with them. He's going to wipe every tear from our eye. No more death, mourning, crying, or pain. That's awesome. <coughs> Always be happy. In fact, here's what I think heaven's going to look like. You see Jesus, and he has you in his arms. I know it's a little hard to see from the you know, stands, as it were. But Jesus will have you in his arms. And you know what? As much as I love pizza, that's even better to know that Jesus holds us in our arms. And you know why we can go to heaven? I need you to help me with this. What's that hanging on the wall? What happened on the cross? Yes, Jesus died and he rose up on Easter. And that's why we not only get pizza buffets on this earth, which I love, but one day we'll be with Jesus face to face. And that, my friends, is awesome. Let's go to our Lord in prayer and you'll all repeat after me. Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father, thank you for sending Jesus, thank you for sending Jesus to open heaven to us to open the heaven to us. Be with us each day, Lord. Be with us each day, Lord, as we look ahead to heaven. As we look ahead to heaven. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay, Heidi? Instructor. This is Rasmussen. She's running back. Ah, Susan. All right. Let's continue with the song, Holy is the Lord. It's in the middle of your service hall. <coughs>
John, one of the last living disciples that walked with Jesus, was living in exile on an island called Patmos. One day, God gave him a vision, commanding him to write letters to seven different churches. John also saw a series of mysterious and symbolic scenes. He saw a door open into heaven, and he was swept up into it. He saw a throne with someone sitting on it. In front of the throne, he saw a lamb looking as if it had been killed. Lightning flashed from the throne and thunder clapped. People and creatures surrounding the throne all fell down and worshipped the lamb. And thousands of angels circled the throne and said in a loud voice, Worthy is the lamb who was slain. Every creature in heaven and on earth gave praise to the lamb and to the one seated on the throne. Next. John saw every person who ever lived standing in front of the throne. A book called the Book of Life opened up. Anyone whose name was not in the Book of Life was thrown into a lake of fire. But for all those whose names were there, something amazing awaited. John saw a bright and shining city descend from the sky. A loud voice told him this was where all of God's people will live and that God will live there among them forever. God will wipe away every tear and there will be no more death, crying, or pain. A river as clear as crystal flowed from the throne of God through the middle of this great city. Next to the river stood the tree of life, which healed the world from every wrong, making all things perfect. Then Jesus himself, standing with John, said, Come, let those who are thirsty come. Let all who wish take a free gift of the water of life. <coughs> Let's go to our Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, as we look ahead to the peace and joy of heaven that you promised to us, Lord, keep us faithful, because there are so many things that can get in the way of that safe journey home. Lord, today you paint an incredible picture of the joy that awaits us. Help us as your people to keep our eyes firmly planted on that, and to realize that in you is life, and life to the full forever. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Brothers, sisters in Christ, it's almost hard for me to believe that we started our journey through the story, through the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, back on September 6th. Now, it all began in the book of Genesis with the words, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. But now as we come to the end of the Bible, the book of Revelation, we see John write, Behold, I see a new heaven and a new earth. Now, I think many people enjoy reading through the book of Genesis because it has the creation, it has the well-known people, many of the stories that some of us or most of us may have well learned when we were in children's church or Sunday school. But then we get to this book of Revelation. I don't know if it's always that enjoyable because we have some unusual things. Dragons, multi-headed beasts, clouds, symbols, numbers, all kinds of strange things that are going on in this book. But we can easily get confused. But let me make it clear. The book of Revelation was never meant to be about confusion. If you understand instead that the book of Revelation is about hope and joy, we can look past a lot of the symbolism that's there because God was delivering a vital message of hope to his people who were really, really struggling at the time. John is writing Revelation as he is sitting in exile on a remote mountainous island that was called Patmos. He had refused to stop claiming that Jesus is the Son of God and is the Savior of the world. So the government tried to get rid of him, as it were, by moving him to this deserted, lonely place. God gave him this revelation at what I firmly believe is the most intense time of persecution that followers of Jesus have ever faced. Because you see, Rome at that time was run by that crazed emperor Nero. Talked a little bit about him last week. 
His goal in life was to destroy Christians. Some faithful people were beheaded. Now, believe it or not, I think they had it easy. Others were thrown into the Colosseum. There, as the crowds were all cheering, wild animals would be put in with them, and these followers of Jesus would be torn apart, limb by limb. Others were dipped in oil and set on fire. You see, all these horrific things were happening to followers of Jesus. From their perspective, when John wrote this, everything was lost. Nero, the crazy guy, seemed to have all the power. They were at his mercy. But then, God opens up this curtain and lets John take a peek of things that were yet to come. Things that you and I can also look forward to. He gives us a peek into his upper story. Remember, that's God's big, overarching, eternal plan for all of us. He wants to give you, as his people, comfort, hope, and courage as we look through this book of Revelation. In fact, John sets the mood for it right off the bat. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the one who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty One. You see, God's in charge, not Nero, not Rome. Then in verse 17, he says, Then I saw him, and I fell at his feet as though I were dead. But then he placed his right hand on me. And he said, don't be afraid. I'm the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead, but now look. I'm alive forever and ever, and I hold in my hands the keys of death and Hades. You see, God has the power. God is still in control. It's a word of encouragement and a word of hope for us, even when our lives get turned topsy-turvy. Now, we may not be under intense persecution, but at times, especially in the last few years, it looks like things are getting a little more bleak. Some today believe, well, it's the government, it's big business, it's world leaders that are in charge. They've got all the chips. They have all the power. But let me be clear. God is still in charge. God still has the power. The story, the book of Revelation, ends with this triumphant note that Jesus is reigning in heaven. He has a very tight relationship. He has built this incredible community with the people that he loves and calls his own. Now, there are three takeaways I'd like us to have this morning from this interesting book of Revelation. Now, they're not just from Revelation, but they're from our entire look at the story from Genesis through Revelation. The first one is this. You can depend on God. If you got absolutely nothing else from our walk from September till now, my prayer is that you get this. When we started this series back in September, I said that it was my hope and my prayer that as we went through this, that you would see the Bible as one continuous story, an ongoing narration. It's not a bunch of disjointed stories from here and there that are all just kind of thrown together and nothing really makes sense. From the beginning in Genesis 1 to the end in Revelation, you see it is one continuous narration. It's one story. God is in a relentless pursuit to be in a relationship with you, with his people, and to live in a tight community with us. I think we've seen that pretty clearly over the last nine months. The Bible, it spans thousands of years and many authors, but it all fits together. It all adds up. Now, there were times when God's people had no clue. They had no idea what God was up to in their lives because they were in their daily lower story. But then they could look back later and realize, okay, so that's what God had in mind when he worked with Abraham, with Noah. It all made sense. It came together. What that means is you can depend on God. He is trustworthy. Now in Revelation, we come full circle. Everything wraps up. He's saying, okay, this is how God's plan all fits together. 
In Genesis, we saw how God created the heavens and the earth. Now in Revelation, he creates the new heaven and the new earth. In Genesis, God created the sun by day and the moon by night to light the way for his people. By the end of Revelation, we don't need that anymore because God's glory lights the way for us. In Genesis, Satan came in and messed everything up. By Revelation, Satan's been banished. He will never be seen again. At the beginning, the tree of life was right out there in the open. But we were forbidden to eat from it after Adam and Eve sinned. But now, in Revelation, the faithful are welcomed back to it. You see, everything that was right in Genesis is even better in Revelation, and everything that ended up being wrong in Genesis is now made right. God kept every promise. What that means is that you and I can depend on Him. Since you can trust and depend on God, there is a second takeaway that we get from the book of Revelation. You have a lot to look forward to. In Revelation 21, God opens up that curtain, gives us a glimpse into heaven, and where we're going to be spending eternity. It all began in verse 1. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and first earth, where we're at now, had passed away. And there was no longer any sea. Now remember, God created us as physical beings. He created this earth a physical place for us to live. In eternity, it's going to be new and perfect. Now by saying this, I'd like to get what is often, well, what many people have is a false picture out of their heads. In heaven, we're not just going to float around the clouds and play harps all day. <laughs> Um, we're not going to spend our day spit shining the streets of gold. That'd be nice, but that's not what heaven is. You see, God created us as real people with a real body, and in heaven, we will be in a real place with a real body and enjoy real life. So think of whatever it is that brings you joy or fun or great peace now. Multiply that to the nth degree in heaven. Please get any notion you may have out of your head that heaven's going to be boring, or that we're just going to sit around all day and sing hymns whether you've got a voice or not. Now, as great as that may be, I don't know that I even want to do that all the time. But God is saying there's a new heaven and a new earth. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, God's dwelling place is among His people, and He will be with them. They will be His people, and God Himself will be their God. Now, I have to admit, I sometimes get jealous when I see that Adam and Eve walked with the Lord in the Garden of Eden. I mean, how awesome will it be to stand in the presence of God's glory and to be with Him face to face forever? He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Now, who's going to wipe away every tear from our eye? Jesus himself. Not Peter, not Gabriel, not some other angel. Jesus himself. You see, the, the Bible does not say, you know, well, you're kind of on your own here. He's going to provide all of that for us. And then he tells us what's not going to be in heaven. Sickness, sorrow, pain, disease, death, no cancer, no dementia, no Alzheimer's, no tear-stained divorce papers, no pink slips, depression, or anxiety. See, we have a lot to look forward to here, don't we? Everything will be new. Verse 5 tells us, He who is seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. Now, since we'll already have a new heaven and new earth, well, what's left to have? Here's the one I look forward to, a new body. Consider these words from Philippians 3. But our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enabled him to bring all things under his control 
will transform our lowly bodies so that they'll be just like his glorious body. We will recognize one another, we'll look the same except even better. But the third takeaway, and this is a big one, is this. Be ready. That's really the message of the book of Revelation. As all of his disciples stood up and watched as Jesus ascended into the clouds, remember what the angels said? They said, be on the lookout. He's coming back. And he will return in the same way in which you saw him go. Now when he returns, all people of all time will be gathered around him. And well, let's be blunt here. One of two destinations. Those who believe in Jesus, the new heaven and the new earth, with these new bodies. But those who do not believe will be cast out. Well, that's a tough one to hear. But God's very clear about this. Revelation 21, 6 states, it is done. I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, to the thirsty. I will give water without cost from the fountain of the water of life. Those who are victorious will inherit this. I will be their God. They will be my children. To those who look to Jesus, to know that it's not about them, but that it's about Him, who know that He gave His life on the cross, that He rose from the dead for them, that's what awaits. But then right after that, this is hard to hear, but the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters, the liars, they will be consigned to the fiery lake of burning sulfur. That's the second death. Now please do not read those words as judgment and hatred. Here's how I read them. They're words of dire concern from a God who is calling out for all of his children. I want you back. I love you too much for any of you to have to face that. The Bible does not say there, well, those people will get what they deserve. Don't we all deserve the sober pit? You see, it's only by the grace of God and the blood of Jesus Christ that we are his children. God's desire is that all people would be saved. Jesus gave his life not for a frozen chosen, but for all. So you and I have a responsibility. We can't just read the Bible, the story, and just let it go with that. This is always a fear of mine that we fall into this trap. We dare not finish the story and say, oh, well, that was nice. I wonder what's next. People need to hear the story. Roughly two-thirds of the people around us, even here in Northern Idaho, have no church home. How many of those claim no Jesus? Jesus said he's coming back. We have a responsibility as individuals and as a congregation to carry on the story. There's still time before Jesus returns. And in a world that's often bleak, we have an answer. From beginning to end, the story is a story of hope and courage. God is in a relentless pursuit to be in a relationship with his people, and he wants to be in a tight-knit community with them. That's why he's coming back. And that's something we can look forward to. Even John got caught off with this. He couldn't wait for Jesus to return, so he ends the Bible with these words. He who testifies to these things says, yes, I'm coming soon. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with all of his people. And isn't that our response too? Come, Lord Jesus. May the Lord continue to bless us as we look forward to our Lord's return with expectation, hope, and joy. Yes, he is coming soon. In Jesus' name, amen. And now may the peace of God, which passes all of our human understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in the true faith of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. This time we'll receive the gathering of our time, talents, and treasures as we receive the offering. If you have a prayer request, I'd ask you to fill out the card in your service folder, place that in the plate as it is passed. 
And also, we fill out the record of fellowship and place that in the plate as it is passed as well. We now receive the offering. This time, I invite you to stand and greet each other in the name of our Lord Jesus. This week, even though it says April 15th, it should say the 29th, it is a prayer for strength because God promises strength to those who ask, and we're called to pray for strength from above as we seek His vision and direction for this congregation and for the community we reach out to. And the verse we're focusing on is Matthew 11, 28. Come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Let's go to our Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, you are a God who provides strength, um, especially as we look to the future. There are some unknowns, in fact, quite a few. Lord, give us the strength to come to you as we sometimes wonder about, well, what's the future of this congregation? What's our role in the community? What specific gifts have you given us that we can share? Lord, give us rest in the midst of that and focus as we see exactly what it is you have in mind for us down the road. And Lord, you also know the things that are on our hearts and our minds this day. We pray of healing for a wife and a son who's depressed, that all of our loved ones and neighbors would believe and trust in you, Almighty God. Um, we pray for, for uh, Marsha Krebs, whose mother passed away Wednesday morning. And um, we ask that you would comfort this family, give them strength and hope in that time of loss and, and the hope that comes in knowing you as Lord and Savior. We pray for all who are suffering. We pray for our families in a world where 
Being a family can be a challenge sometimes for our congregation, and we pray for Bob with heart problems, and a thank you that we're home safely. We pray for Pam who's in life care, for Jeff who's dealing with mental illness and an alcohol addiction, and Amy who's addicted to pain medications, that, that you would give them strength, and for Tina and her journey through colon cancer. Lord, you know the things that are on our hearts and minds. You provide healing and hope, and we can only have questions instead of answers. Lord, we pray that you would be with the sick, the needy, the hospitalized, those who are dealing with cancer, treatments for it, ongoing depression, substance abuse issues. Lord, provide them with help and healing in this time of need. And we pray you'd be with those who are caring for them, their caregivers, as they work to make life a bit easier. We pray for our community garden, Lord, as it slowly but surely comes together in the next weeks and months. Lord, we pray for Christ our Redeemer, for our little lambs, preschool, pre-kindergarten and kindergarten, that these would all be places not just to grow, as we heard this morning, but to go, to share the good news. And we pray for our community, for Sandpoint and Bonner County, that the light of your love would shine brightly and that more and more people would come to know you as Lord and Savior. All these prayers we bring before you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. As Jesus gathered with his disciples in that upper room to celebrate the Passover, this became his meal, the Lord's Supper, given for them and for us to strengthen them in their journey of faith. And it's a meal that prepared them to be whole with them in heaven. There's actually an old German story about when we gather at the communion rail, we think of it as being circular. We are gathered on this side. And the saints that are already in heaven are joining us as we gather together around his meal. That's a powerful image. And it's a reminder to us of what this supper provides. His body and his blood for us. Let's prepare to receive it as we continue with the preface on the top of the page. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and singing. This cup is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sin. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as we eat this bread and we drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you all. 